Then he came to a very quiet place called Leave Heaven Alone. And there the sun was drawing water out of the sea to make steam threads. And the wind was twisting them up to make cloud patterns till they had worked between them the loveliest wedding veil of Chantilly lace and hung it up in their own crystal palace for anyone to buy who could afford it. While the good old sea never grudged, for she knew that they would pay her back honestly. So the sun span and the wind wove, and all went well with the great steam loom, as is likely considering and considering and considering. And at last, after innumerable adventures, each more wonderful than the last, he saw before him a huge building, much bigger, and what is most surprising, a little uglier than a certain new lunatic asylum, but not built quite of the same materials, none of it at least, or indeed, for aught that I ever saw, any part of any other building whatsoever, is cased with nine-inch brick inside and out and filled up with rubble between the walls, in order that any gentleman who's been confined during Her Majesty's pleasure may be unconfined during his own pleasure, and take a walk in the neighbouring park to improve his spirits after an hour's light and wholesome labour with his dinner fork, or one of the legs of his iron bedstead. Though the walls of this building were built on an entirely different principle, which need not be described, it has not yet been discovered. Tom walked towards this great building, wondering what it was, and having a strange fancy that he might find Mr. Grimes inside it, till he saw running toward him and shouting, Stop! Three or four people, who when they came nearer were nothing else than policemen's truncheons running along without legs or arms. Tom was not astonished. He was long past that. Besides, he'd seen the naviculae in the water move nobody knows how a hundred times without arms or legs or anything to stand in their stead. Neither was he frightened, for he had been doing no harm. So he stopped. And when the foremost truncheon came up and asked his business, he showed Mother Carey's pass. And the truncheon looked at it in the oddest fashion, for he had one eye in the middle of his upper end, so that when he looked at anything... Being quite stiff, he had to slope himself and poke himself till he was a wonder why he didn't tumble over. But being quite full of the spirit of justice, as all policemen and their truncheons ought to be, he was always in a position of stable equilibrium, whichever way he put himself. All right, pass on, said he at last. And then he added, I'd better go with you, young man. And Tom had no objection, for such company was both respectable and safe, so the truncheon coiled its thong neatly round its handle, to prevent tripping itself up, for the thong had got loose in running, and marched on by Tom's side. "'Why have you no policeman to carry you?' asked Tom after a while. "'Because we're not like those clumsy made truncheons in the land world, which cannot go without having a whole man to carry them about.' We do our own work for ourselves, and we do it very well, though I say it, who should not? Then why have you a thong to your handle? asked Tom. To hang ourselves up by, of course, when we're off duty. Tom had got his answer, and had no more to say till they came up to a great iron door of the prison, and there the truncheon knocked twice with its own head. A wicket in the door opened, and out looked a tremendous old brass blunderbuss, charged up to the muzzle with slugs, who was the porter. Tom started back a little at the sight of him. "'What case is this?' he asked in a deep voice, out of his broad bell mouth. "'If you please, sir, it's no case, only a young gentleman from her ladyship, who wants to see Grimes, the master sweep.' "'Grimes!' said the blunderbuss as he pulled in his muscle, muzzle, perhaps, to look over his prison lists. "'Grimes is up chimney number three, four, five, he said from inside, "'so the young gentleman had better go on to the roof.' Tom looked up at the enormous wall, which seemed at least ninety miles high, and wondered how he could ever get up. 
But when he hinted that to the truncheon, it settled the matter in a moment, for it whisked round, gave him such a shove behind, as sent him up to the roof in no time, with his little dog under his arm. And there he walked along the leads, until he met another truncheon, and told him his errand. Very good, it said, come along, but it will be of no use. He is the most unremorseful, hard-hearted, foul-mouthed fellow I have in charge, and thinks about nothing but beer and pipes, which are not allowed here, of course. So they walked along over the leads, and very sooty they were, and Tom thought the chimneys must want sweeping very much. But he was surprised to see that the soot did not stick to his feet, or dirty them in the least. Neither did the live coals which were lying about in plenty burn him. For being a water baby, his radical humours were of a moist and cold nature. As you may read at large in Lemnius, Cardan, Van Helmont, and other gentlemen who knew as much as they could, and no man can know more. And at last they came to chimney number 345. Out of the top of it, his head and shoulders just showing, stuck poor Mr Grimes, so sooty and bleared and ugly that Tom could hardly bear to look at him. And in his mouth was a pipe. But it was not a light, though he was pulling at it with all his might. Attention, Mr Grimes, said the truncheon. Here is a gentleman come to see you. But Mr Grimes only said bad words and kept grumbling. My pipe won't draw. My pipe won't draw. Keep a single civil tongue and, and attend, said the truncheon and popped up just like punch, hitting Grimes such a crack over the head with itself that his brains rattled inside like a dried walnut in its shell. He tried to get his hands out and rub the place, but he could not, for they were stuck fast in the chimney. Now he was forced to attend. Hey, he said. Why, it's Tom! I suppose you come here to laugh at me, you spiteful little atomy! Tom assured him he had not, but only wanted to help him. I don't want anything except beer, and that I can't get, and a light to this bothering pipe that I can't get either. I'll get you one, said Tom, and he took up a live coal, there were plenty lying about, and put it to Grimes's pipe, but it went out instantly. It's no use, said the truncheon, leaning itself up against the chimney and looking on. I tell you, it's no use. His heart is so cold that it freezes everything that comes near him. You'll see that presently, plain enough. Oh, of course it's my fault. Everything's always my fault, said Grimes. Now don't go to hit me again. For the truncheon started upright and looked very wicked. You know, if my arms were only free, you dare hit me then. The truncheon leant back against the chimney, took no notice of the personal insult, like a well-trained policeman as it was, though he was ready enough to avenge any transgression against morality or order. But can't I help you in any other way? Can't I help you to get out of this chimney, said Tom. No, interposed the truncheon. He's come to the place where everybody must help themselves, and he'll find it out, I hope, before he's done with me. Oh, yes, said Grimes. Of course it's me. Did I ask to be brought here into the prison? Did I ask to be set to sweep your foul chimneys? Did I ask to have lighted straw put under me to make me go up? Did I ask to stick fast in the very first chimney of all, because it was so shamefully clogged up with soot? Did I ask to stay here? I don't know how long, a hundred years, I do believe, and never get my pipe, nor my beer, nor nothing fit for a beast, let alone a man. No, answered a solemn voice behind. No more did Tom, when you behaved to him in the very same way. It was Mrs. Be done by as you did, and when the truncheon saw her, it started bolt upright, attention, and made such a low bow that if it had not been full of the spirit of justice, it must have tumbled on its end, it probably hurt its one eye. And Tom made his bow too. Oh, Ma'am, he said, don't think about me, that's all past and gone, and good times and bad times and all times pass over. But may not I help poor Mr. Grimes? Mayn't I try and get some of these bricks away, that he may move his arms? You may try, of course, she said. So Tom pulled and tugged at the bricks, but he couldn't move one. And then he tried to wipe Mr Grimes's face, but the soot would not come off. Oh dear, he said, I've come all this way through all these terrible places to help you, 
and now I'm of no use at all. You'd best leave me alone, said Grimes. You're a good-natured, forgiving little chap, and that's truth. But you'd best be off. The hail's coming soon, and it will beat the eyes out of your little head. What hail? Why, hail that falls every evening here. Until it comes close to me, it's like so much warm rain, but then it turns to hail over my head. Knocks me about like small shot. That hail will never come any more, said the strange lady. I've told you before what it was. It was your mother's tears, those which she shed when she prayed for you beside by her bedside. But your cold heart froze it into hail. But she's gone to heaven now and will weep no more for her graceless son. Then Grimes was silent a while, and then he looked very sad. So, my old mother's gone, and I'm never there to speak to her. Ah, a good woman she was, and might have been a happy one in her little school there in Vendale, if it hadn't been for me and my bad ways. Did she keep the school in Vendale? asked Tom. And then he told Grimes all the story about his going to her house, and how she could not abide the sight of a chimney sweep, and then how kind she was, and how he turned into a water baby. Ah, said Grimes, good reason she had to hate the sight of a chimney sweep. I ran away from her and took up with the sweeps and never let her know where I was, nor sent her a penny to help her. And now it's too late, too late, said Mr Grimes. And he began crying and blubbering like a great baby till his pipe dropped out of his mouth and broke all to bits. Oh, dear, if I was but a little chap in Vendale again, to see the clear beck and the apple orchard and the, and the yew hedge, how different I would go on. But it's too late now. So you go along, you kind little chap, and don't stand to look at a man crying. That's, that's old enough to be your father. And never feared the face of man, nor of worse neither. But I'm beat now, and beat I must be. I've made my bed, and I must lie on it. Foul I would be, and foul I am, as an Irish woman said to me once, and little I heeded it. It's all my own fault, but it's too late. And he cried so bitterly that Tom began crying too. Never too late said the fairy, in such a strange, soft, new voice that Tom looked up at her, and she was so beautiful for the moment that Tom half fancied she was her sister. No more was it too late, for as poor Grimes cried and blubbered on, his own tears did what his mother's could not do, and Tom's could not do, and nobody's on earth could do for him, for they washed the soot off his face and off his clothes, and then they washed the mortar away from between the bricks, and the chimney crumbled down and Grimes began to get out of it. Up jumped the truncheon and was going to hit him on the crown, a tremendous thump, and drive him down again like a cork into a bottle. But the strange lady put it aside. Will you obey me if I give you a chance? As you please, ma'am. You're stronger than me, that I know too well, and wiser than me, I know too well also. And as for being my own master, I've fared ill enough with that as yet. So whatever your ladyship pleases to order me, for I'm beat, and that's the truth. Be it so then, you may come out, but remember, disobey me again, and into a worse place still you go. I beg pardon, ma'am, but I never disobeyed you that I know of. I never had the honour of setting eyes upon you till I came to these ugly quarters. Never saw me? Who said to you, those that will be foul... Foul they will be. Grimes looked up, and Tom looked up too, for the voice was suddenly that of the Irish woman who met them the day that they went out together to Hearthover. I gave you your warning then, but you gave it yourself a thousand times before and since. Every bad word that you said, every cruel and mean thing that you did, every time that you got tipsy, every day that you went dirty, you were disobeying me whether you knew it or not. Oh, if only I'd known, Mum. You knew well enough that you were disobeying something, though you did not know it was me. But come out and take your chance. Perhaps it may be your last. 
So Grimes stepped out of the chimney, and really, if it had not been for the scars on his face, he looked as clean and respectable as a master sweep need look. Take him away, said she to the truncheon, and give him his ticket of leave. And what is he to do, ma'am? Get him to sweep out the crater of Etna. He will find some very steady men working out their time there, who will teach him his business. But mind, if that crater gets choked again, and there's an earthquake in consequence, bring them all to me, and I shall investigate the case very severely. So the truncheon marched off Mr Grimes, looking as meek as a drowned worm. And for aught I know, or do not know, he's sweeping the crater of Etna to this very day. And now, said the fairy to Tom, your work here is done. You may as well go back again. I should be glad enough to go, said Tom, but how am I to get up that great hole again, now that the steam has stopped blowing? Oh, I'll take you up the back stairs. But I must bandage your eyes first, for I never allow anyone to see those back stairs of mine. I'm sure I shall not tell anybody about them, ma'am, if you bid me not. Ha ha! So you think, my little man, but you would soon forget your promise if you got back into the land world. For if people only once found out that you had been up my back stairs, you'd have all the fine ladies kneeling to you, and the rich men emptying their purses before you, and statesmen offering you place and power, and young and old, rich and poor, crying to you, only tell us the great backstairs secret, and we will be your slaves. We will make you lord, king, emperor, bishop, archbishop, pope, if you like. Only tell us the secret of the backstairs. For thousands of years we have been paying and petting and obeying and worshipping quacks who told us they had the key of the backstairs and could smuggle us up them. And in spite of all our disappointments, we will honour and glorify and order and adore and beatify and translate and apotheotize you likewise on the chance of your knowing something about the backstairs, that we may all go on pilgrimage to it. And even if we cannot get up it, lie at the foot of it and cry, Oh, backstairs, precious backstairs, invaluable backstairs, requisite backstairs. Necessary backstairs, reasonable backstairs, long sought backstairs, coveted backstairs, respectable backstairs, credible backstairs, demonstrable backstairs, potent backstairs, all but omnipotent backstairs, and so on. Save us. Save us from the consequences of our own actions and from the cruel fairy Miss Miss be done by as you did. Do not you think that you would be a little tempted then to tell them what you know, laddie? Tom thought so certainly. But why do they want so to know about the back stairs? asked he, being a little frightened at the long words and not understanding them the least, as indeed he was not meant to do, or you either. That I shall not tell you. I never put things into little folks' heads which are but too likely to come there of themselves. So come, now I must bandage your eyes. So she tied the bandage on his eyes with one hand and with the other. She took it off. Now, she said, you are safe up the stairs. Tom opened his eyes very wide and his mouth too, for he had not, as he thought, moved a single step. But when he looked round him, there could be no doubt that he was safe up the back stairs, whatsoever they may be, which no man is going to tell you, for the plain reason that no man knows. The first thing which Tom saw was the black cedars, high and sharp against the rosy dawn, and St Brandon's Isle reflected double in the still broad silver sea. The wind sang softly in the cedars, and the water sang among the eaves, and the seabirds sang as they streamed out into the ocean, and the land birds as they built among the boughs. And the air was so full of song that it stirred St. Brandon and his hermits as they slumbered in the shade. Then they moved their good old lips and sang their morning hymn amid their dreams. But among all the songs one came across the water more sweet and clear than all, for it was the song of a young girl's voice. And what was the song that she sang? Ah, my little man, I'm too old to sing that song, and you too young to understand it. But have patience, and keep your eyes single, and your hands clean, and you will learn some day to sing it yourself, 
without needing any man to teach you. And as Tom neared the island, there sat upon a rock the most graceful creature that ever was seen, looking down with her chin upon her hand and paddling with her feet in the water. And when they came to her, she looked up, and behold, it was Ellie. Oh, Miss Ellie, said he, how you're grown. Oh, Tom, said she, how you are grown too. And no wonder, they were both quite grown up, he into a tall man, and she into a beautiful woman. Perhaps I may be grown, she said. I have had time enough, for I have been sitting here waiting for you many a hundred years, till I thought you were never coming. Many a hundred years, thought Tom. But he had seen so much in his travels that he had quite given up being astonished, and indeed he could think of nothing but Ellie. So he stood and looked at Ellie, and Ellie looked at him, and they liked the employment so much that they stood and looked for seven years more, and neither spoke nor stirred. At last they heard the fairy say, Attention, children! Are you never going to look at me again? We've been looking at you all this while, they said. And so they thought they had been. Then look at me once more, said she. They looked, and both of them cried out at once, Oh, who are you after all? You are our dear Mrs. Do as you would be done by. No, you're good, Mrs. Be done by as you did, but you're grown quite beautiful now. To you, said the fairy. But look again. You are Mother Carey, said Tom in a very low, solemn voice, for he had found out something which made him very happy, and yet frightened him more than all that he had ever seen. But you're grown quite young again. To you, said the fairy. Look again. You're the Irish woman who met me the day I went to Hartover. And then, when they looked, she was neither of them, and yet all of them at once. My name is written in my eyes, if you have eyes to see it there. And they looked into her great, deep, soft eyes, and they changed again and again into every hue as the light changes in a diamond. Now read my name, said she at last. And her eyes flashed for one moment clear, white, blazing light, but the children could not read her name, for they were dazzled and hid their faces in their hands. Not yet, young things, not yet, said she, smiling. And then she turned to Ellie. You may take him home with you now on Sundays, Ellie. He's won his spurs in the great battle and become fit to go with you and be a man, because he has done the thing he did not like. So Tom went home with Ellie on Sundays, and sometimes on weekdays too. And he's now a great man of science and can plan railroads and steam engines electric telegraphs and rifled guns and so forth, knows everything about everything, except why a hen's egg don't turn into a crocodile, and two or three other little things which no one will know till the coming of the cocky grues, and all this from what he learnt when he was a water baby, underneath the sea. And of course Tom married Ellie? My dear child, what a silly notion. Don't you know that no one ever marries in a fairy tale, under the rank of a prince or a princess? And Tom's dog? Ah, you may see him any clear night in July, for the old dog star was so worn out by the last three hot summers that there have been no dog days since, so that they had to take him down and put Tom's dog up in his place. Therefore, as new brooms sweep clean, we may hope for some warm weather this year. And that is the end of my story.